Morning, everybody. How are we? Does anybody feel like you should still be asleep right now? Anybody? Anybody else feel like that? All right. Well, thank you so much for making the time this morning to join us. It's great to be with you. Um, I got a question for you as we start off today. Have you ever watched a, a movie about a real-life event and wondered what would it would have been like to be part of that and then at the same time not knowing how that story was going to work out? Right? You, you think about the Cuban Missile Crisis, right, or, or D-Day during World War II, and you think, what would it have been like to have been there and not know how that story would have worked out? Well, in, uh, I'm going to start us off with a story today. Um, it's, it's our story. It's an American story. In, uh, in between the years of 1861 and 1865 was the American Civil War. So you literally had brother fighting brother. And uh, by 1865, 620,000 Americans had died because they had killed each other. This, this was a war of humanity on humanity. It, it was a war of um, people because of their religion, because of the, the morality, because of the economy, because of the politics. There were so many things all mixed into this battle. And now both, both North and South were reading the Bible every day, right? And then they would pray for the strength to defeat the other side. By, uh, by that time in America's history, there's about 31 million people in our country. And, and during that civil war, very, very few of them had been untouched by the war. See, what had happened was in the build-up to 1861, two radically different visions of the, the nation of America had been emerging politically, economically, socially, in so many different ways. Two radically different narratives had come up. And then five years later, because of those polarized interests in the nation, five years later, so many people had died. Now... By eight, or early 1865, it was clear that the North was going to win this, was going to win this war. And uh, so one day, there was a reporter who asked President Abraham Lincoln the question, what are you going to do with the rebellious southern states when this war is over? Because clearly the North was going to win this war. And the president said this. He said, I will treat them as though they had never been away. You see, the, the reporter who had asked him that question, he, he was waiting for that moment of triumph where, where the North could, could celebrate the triumph over the South, whereas the president was looking for an opportunity to rebuild the nation. It's really it's amazing how the perspective of a victor differs based on what it is that they think they've won. See, see, the reporter thought he had won the right to a victory dance in a battlefield graveyard, but whereas the president, he thought he had won an opportunity to rebuild the nation of the United States. Did, did you ever just stop and think, like, what, what are our battles? What are our games? What, what are we trying to win? How are we going about that? We're, we're in a, stories right, a series right now called The Storyteller. We're on the way to uh, Easter um, during Lent, we're going through the parables of Jesus. So, so we're looking at each of the stories that he told. And um, as we do that, we're getting sort of a reality check, right? So, so there's all kinds of concerns we have in the moment, in time, the things that we worry about. And we're learning to look at that in the light of eternity, and this week, that gets really, really personal because this week we're, we're looking at one of the most um, well-known parables of Jesus, and it's a man who had two sons. It's a, um, it's a story that I think by the end of this, we're going to be able to relate to both sons, the older son and the younger son, and I hope that by the end of this, we're all going to recognize our need for a father like we see in this story. So the story is known as the prodigal son, and uh, it picks up in uh, Luke, the, the book of uh, Luke chapter 15. So you can turn there if you'd like to in your Bibles, or you could use the church app, 
and, uh, and follow along if that's easier. But the, the context of this chapter, the chapter opens with Luke again describing the audience, the, the crowd that had gathered around Jesus. Je the person of Jesus is incredibly attractive to people as he, he shares God's truth, God's love, God's ways. People come. Everybody comes. And so as he's telling this story, these, these crowds of thousands of people are gathering. In that crowd, there's what were described by Luke as tax collectors and sinners. So he didn't want to offend the sinners by calling them including tax collectors. See, tax collectors had a category all their own. See, tax collectors, at this time, the Jewish nation had been invaded by Rome. So they were, under an, they were basically an occupied nation. And so the tax collectors were Jewish people who would extract taxes from their own people and then give it to the invading force, the Romans, and to Caesar. So these were not popular people. And um, the accusation of the religious leaders in that moment uh, that we're looking at in here, Luke 15, was that Jesus met with tax collectors and sinners. As this man welcomes sinners... And he eats with them. So, so it's sort of like they're, they're doing guilt by association, right? They're playing a shame game. And the way to win a shame game is to make the first move. You make the first move, you're probably going to win. But what Jesus does in response to that is he just decides he's not going to play that game. It, it, isn't it? It's, it's just so humbling sometimes when we realize that God is not actually interested in playing the games that we're beckoning him to, that we're inviting him to play. And instead, Jesus tells him a story. And uh, so he, he opens with a short story about a sheep who got lost. He strayed away. Shepherd goes and finds him. He brings him back, and he, he celebrates finding that sheep. And uh, Jesus brings out the point that the angels celebrate more in heaven about one sinner who repents the, the 99 other people who think they have no need of repentance. And, and see, this story in that moment would have triggered for that audience, the, the Jewish audience who knew the Torah very well, that would have triggered a memory of Isaiah 53 verse 6, that, which says that we all, all of us like sheep have gone astray. Each one of us have turned to our own way. Now, so I think that story was sort of Jesus' way of pursuing the people who thought they were fine before God. It, it was his way of inviting them to this celebration, almost making them jealous of the people who were turning to God and being celebrated in that way. And he tells a second story. He tells a, a story about a lady who lost a coin. The coin uh, dropped on the floor somewhere. She searches everywhere until she finds it, and then she calls her friends and celebrates finding that coin. So in both of these stories, the point that Jesus explicitly is bringing out is that repentance is the pivot point in the story, and when that happens, the angels in heaven celebrate that. And that's his point. So, so I want us to be clear on this before we get into our, our story that we're going to focus on today, uh, because that, that pivot point is so close to the core of our human reality. See, here's the thing. Um, the characteristic difference between a true prophet and a false prophet is the call to repentance. Here's why. A, a false prophet wants to please people. He depends on people. He depends on their favor, their, all, all this kind of stuff. So, so a, a false prophet wants to please people, so he caters to their pride. A true prophet cares enough about us to confront us when that's necessary because he's trying to please God. So there's a difference between those two voices. See, see repentance, that, that choice to turn from our own ways and turn to what God is calling us to and walk in the other direction, that offers God an opportunity to rewrite our story. So what happens is repentance turns our story, the story we're writing, into His story, a story that He's now writing. That's, that's what it does. See, the, the reality is that God is not going to be led by us on a road that leads to death. He's not going to follow along with us like a puppy dog there. 
that repentance is an exchange of the right to lead. And when we repent, we're giving God that right. And when we do that, the angels celebrate that. because The angels are celebrating a life in which God's glory, who He is, can now uh, come into full, full view. And, and then Jesus tells a third parable, and this is our, our focus for the day. And uh, we're going to go through this and try, we're going to try to experience this story in the way that the people of the time would have experienced that story, step by step. So we're going to pick it up here in verse uh, 11 of uh, Luke 15. So Jesus continued, there was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Now let's pause there, because in Jewish culture of the time, the, the younger son would have been less in authority. He would have gotten less inheritance. He might have been disciplined a little less. I don't know if anyone's picked up on that, but the younger child sometimes gets disciplined a little less, um, gets away with more. Um, yes, I'm an older son. But he, but he still could order the servants around, right? So he could still, still, still tell the servants, you know, you do this, you do that. So if this younger son was someone with a tremendous ego, then the only place that that ego could be fully realized was outside the context of the family. He, he was never going to catch up to his older brother, right? So at the end of the day, that's the, that's the option that he chose, and so he, he now has his part of the total family estate completely at his command. So it is now time to live the dream, right? So not long after that, the younger son got together all he had. He set off for a distant country, and there he squandered his wealth with wild living. You, you know, that's the problem with living the dream is you don't wake up and get a free reset. Once it's spent, it's, it's actually gone. The consequences start to catch up to us once we start to live the dream. See, see most of the family wealth uh, at that time would have been caught up with land, with livestock, and with your living quarters, so, so your house, your living space. In order for him to get up and move all his wealth to a far different distant country, he would have had to liquidate everything, literally everything, and just turn it into cold, hard cash. Now, in Jewish culture of the time, you don't eat pork, you do not collect Rome's taxes from Jews, and you never, ever, ever sell your family property. That, that property has been with us since Moses and Joshua. I mean, selling your property would have been utter contempt, would be a savage form of contempt. So, so as the younger son left, that wasn't just goodbye. I mean, the, the listeners of that time would have understood that as good riddance is the way that they're interpreting that. So the younger son in Jesus' story here, he plays out the stereotype like an absolute star here, right? It, so he, he's in a land far, far away, and he's paying for every relationship that he needs, and he finds that there's actually a lot of people who are ready to exchange real money for fake honor. Hey, you know, we do that, right? We all do that. We all tell ourselves stories about who we really are and what life is going to be like when we win the game that we're playing right now. But, but reality catches up to us. You know, and sometimes along that road, God, God humbles us. I'm going to tell you a story. When, when I was in college, I had this red hatchback car, and I loved that car. I went all up and down the East Coast in this little red hatchback, so much fun. And when I was in college, my roommate one day, he was complaining that he had just gotten a speeding ticket. And uh, so I was making fun of him. I was like, ah, oh, you got a speeding ticket. He was a real conscientious guy, right? I'm like, ah, oh, you got a speeding ticket. I speed all the time. I've never gotten a ticket. <laughs> 72 hours later, <laughs> 72 hours later, I had been stopped for speeding three times. I had racked up more than two weeks of salary in fines and I had two court summons. Yeah, now I'm sure, I'm sure that there is a psychologist somewhere 
that could have convinced a judge that, you know, I, I was missing something in my childhood, and so I shouldn't be blamed for acting out, right? I'm sure there's a lawyer somewhere that could have convinced a jury that, you know, it was the stress of college life, you know, he's over that now, so you should just go easy on him, right? And I'm, I'm sure there's a teenager here who's taking notes on how to get out of a ticket, and I can help you with that. <laughs> But at the end of the day, my choices got me where I was. I was personally responsible for the choices I made and the consequences faced by me and by other people. See, I, I think we can absorb that into the context of our, our, our story here about the younger son. See, the younger son in this parable was not excused by Jesus. He didn't make, Jesus didn't make it a matter of bad parenting or class or caste or race or creed or, or whatever one of the categories or ways we try to slice the pie. Je Jesus left the burden of responsibility solidly on this kid's shoulders. See, Jesus was not picturing him as a mindless sheep who wandered off or a coin that got dropped. The reality was, he made a choice, and I think every single one of us can relate to that. I can relate to that. So, so now, to the Jews listening, this, uh, they were living within a framework of, of uh, honor and shame, right? So, in, an, in a game of honor and shame, once you mess up that bad, you're done. This is game over. So, so they're just, they're, there's really no coming back for, from the situation that this younger son is in right now. And so because of that, they're just, they're just they know this story. They know how this is going to play out. So they're just waiting for that hammer to drop on this kid. So here's what happened next. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country. And he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. He longed for, to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. What a change from what he just experienced in wild living, right? Mm -hmm. see, see, not only did the hammer drop on this kid, I mean, the, the bottom fell out of the whole bucket on this kid. And the crowd right now is enjoying this brief moment of righteous indignation, right? So kind of like what we feel when we're watching a TV serial about a detective and the bad guy gets caught and we're like, yeah! See, we can relate to that. Uh, we're, we're, we're waiting for this kid just to die at this point in time. So you got a, a Pharisee over here. you got a tax collector standing shoulder to shoulder looking down on this kid, condemning him and judging this kid. They feel like kings. You, you know, in a way, in a way, we, we all want to be king of some mountain, right? But... We're also nervous when we're pursuing being king of whatever mountain it is we're trying to chase up. We're nervous because we know that the mountain at the end of the day is bigger than we are, and it always will be. That we know that reality is always going to be bigger than our efforts and technology to control it. But we still have that fantasy, right? And G.K. Chesterton once, he wrote about that fantasy and he said this. He said, fairy tales don't tell children that dragons exist. Ch children already know that dragons exist. Fairy tales tell children that the dragons can be killed. See, this, the whole time the, the crowd is feeding on this kid's suffering. They're, they're waiting for him to fail and fail spectacularly, right, dramatically. And, and they're looking for that because they, they hunger for that sense of transcendence, being above it all, having something to look down on, saying, ha, thank you, Jesus, I'm not that bad. That, that's what, they're, that's what they're, they're saying. I mean, look at that kid. That, that kid is knee-deep in pig poop, 
dying of starvation. That's bad. I mean, it, tax collectors are judging this kid, right? When a Jewish man who collects Roman taxes is judging you, you're done. You, you're done, done. You, you're the burger that got left on the grill all night long with the fire on. Poof. You're done. And that's where the whole crowd is at this point in time. So, so for them, this story is over. But the thing is, it wasn't their story to tell. This was Jesus' story. And he's not done. He's not done telling it. See, see, in this story right here, with this kid knee-deep in pig poop, one thing changed. Now, now in, our lives, uh, in our lives, constantly things are changing, right? We have change every single day. But sometimes there's this one thing that changes everything else. So Jesus continues. He says this, When he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up, and he went back to his father. See, in this story, one thing changed. He repented. He, he got up, he turned around, and he walked in the other direction. See, see, that's where this story is fundamentally different than the story of the sheep and the coin. See, the sheep mindlessly wandered off. The coin got dropped. A coin can't repent. It can't sin. We can actually do both. And I think this is where this gets really, really personal. Yeah, did, did you ever wonder why the father didn't just say, uh, no, when the son asked for the inheritance? You ever wonder why he didn't just say no? It's because he didn't see his son as a robot to be programmed, a, a caged bird to be controlled. He, he saw him as a son. And he treated him as a son. See, what the father wanted was a relationship with this son. And to, to have a relationship, you must have freedom of choice. See, when he left, the father stayed. The father was taking care of the rest of the household. But the father was also watching the horizon every day. See, the reality was, it was the, the son's pivot point, his, his inflection point, where the whole story changed was where he got up and he turned back. That's what, that was the starting point for the change. And, and I, want us to, I want us to get this. I want us to grasp the difference between sinner and sin, okay? Between acceptance of a person that God loves and affirmation of a sin that God will not affirm. We, we've got to see the difference between that. See, the thing is, God, God does convict us. He pursues us constantly. We do need to respond to that. So, so let's hear this in, in the cultural moment we're in, in the story moment we're in. Let, let's really hear this. See, the thing is, so long as we insist on leading... God is not going to follow us, okay? There, there is no scenario, none, where we whistle and God comes to heal. I need you to affirm me. Please hear this. That will never, ever happen. It just won't happen. If you're looking down at a God who you're treating like a puppy dog, that is a God you created in your own mind. He's not the God of creation who loves you, who calls you. See, the, the thing is that the road we're on leads to death. God is not going to follow us down that road. He wants, uh, he wants us alive. 
He wants us with Him. But I want us to hear this part too, okay? The other part of this is that the moment that we repent and we turn to God, He runs to us. See, the thing is, that younger son, once he hit the horizon, he wasn't walking back alone. The, the father was walking with him. Here's what happened next. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son. He threw his arms around him and he kissed him. You see, the father was not going to follow so long as the son was leading. But as soon as the son turned around, the father had been watching that horizon. He knew his son so well that he, even from that distance, he could recognize just the walking gait of his son uh, uh, among hundreds of other people who were on the road that day. And when he saw his son, he ran to him. Right? That, that's not something that a dignified Jewish patriarch ever does. They don't run through the road in the middle of the day. That doesn't happen. But, but that's the picture that Jesus is painting here. He's painting a picture of this intense, authentic, undignified, but beautiful love of a father for his son. And this is how it happens. The, the son said to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. And the crowd listening is like, you think? <laughs> but, but listen to what the, the prodigal son thought was at stake here. See, see, what he thought was at stake was a hot meal in the servants' quarters. And that's, that's where he was, he was finished. He, he knew the shame game was over, and he knew he had lost. But the thing is, the shame game, that ended the moment that he'd repented. Because when he repented, what happened is his story became his father's story. The story he was writing became a, a story that was now offered to his father to rewrite and to restart. That's a different game. It begins a different story. And we need to see that. See, here's what happened. But the father said to his, serv his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. See, that, that's not just forgiveness. That's rebirth. That, that's adoption. That, that's the only way that, that shame is actually resolved. See, the reality is that every piece of this outfit that we're seeing here, every piece of that had symbology that the crowd listening would have understood. See, see, the robe was the father's own robe. So if he's wearing that robe, he's family. The, the ring, the, the ring represented authority. So the ring represented sort of like power of attorney would today. It, it represented you're not just part of this family, you have authority within this family. And then he, put, he said, put sandals on his feet. See, the thing is, in those times, the, the servants often went around barefoot. So, so the, the, the family would consistently be wearing shoes um, in getting around. So it was a sign that he, that he had dignity in that place that was given him by the father. See, to the crowd listening, th this father would now have been seen as a person of phenomenal grace, staggering grace, absolutely phenomenal honor. In other words, he would have been a person with enough honor within himself that he could absorb that gross dishonor of this younger son, and he, and he would have been seen to absorb that. So, sort of like watching a, a summer storm pass over the ocean, you get all the thunderclouds and clapping, and then once the storm blows over, the ocean just stays right there. See, to the stunned crowd in this moment, that sun is now fully restored. He, he's fully forgiven. He's fully a member of the family. 
And the father locks it in but with this declaration. The father says this. He says, For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. See, see this dead and lost son was alive and found because two things happened. He repented. The father forgave him. And you know, that's actually the last we hear about the prodigal son in this story. The prodigal son, we see him walking into a celebration with his father, and that's the last we hear of the prodigal son. But the, the thing is, this man had two sons. So in reality, the story's not quite over, old, over yet, right? So the older son, he's been working in the fields all day long, as he has all his life, and he comes back home at the end of the day, and he hears the sound of celebration, and so he asks the servants, what's up? So he says, oh, your, your younger brother has come home. He doesn't rejoice. He is enraged by this. So, so his father comes out and talks to the older son, and the older son has this to say. He answered his father, look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders, yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could, I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours, who has squandered your property with prostitutes, comes home, you kill the fattened calf. See, see the older brother had the mindset that he was earning his right to be called son. He was earning his inheritance. He, he was working alongside his aging father, taking care of the estate, and he was earning his right to be called son. And now, for some of us, for some of us, I hate to say it, but that's our gospel. We live like that. We think like that. It, we, we think that, that we were saved by grace, but now that we're saved, we have to earn God's grace to keep it. If that's where you're at, please go home today and read the book of Galatians. Okay? That'll, that'll help you with that. See, the reality is that, that sonship doesn't work like that. Faithfulness, yeah, faithfulness requires our effort. Sonship does not work like that. See, the younger brother was working to earn his place as son, earn his inheritance, and he thought that gave him the right to sonship, the right to his inheritance. So, so he comes home, and he hears this celebration of the younger son who is the polar opposite of what he spent his whole life trying to do and be. And it just turns his whole world upside down and inside out. He's like, what on earth are you celebrating? So here's how the father responded. He said, my son. See, in his, in his statement of the father, he said, your son. Not my brother, he said, your son. So in a way, he, he, he was ripping at the fabric of the family. And the father immediately restores that, and he calls him my son. He, he goes on, he says this. He says, you are always with me. In other words, I'm, work, I'm working with you side by side every day, rebuilding our family estate. That's me, working beside you. I see your faithfulness. And everything that I have is yours. In other words, there's no redividing the inheritance. Everything we've built together, it's all yours. Do you remember that verse that we read last week where Jesus was saying, Fear not, little flock. Your Father has seen fit to give you the kingdom. Do you remember that verse? See, see, that's what the Father wants. That's what the Father is trying to win. The father wins when his children spend their lives with him. That's what he wins. So everything I have is yours. Then the father finishes it off and he says this, but we had to celebrate. We had to be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and he is found. And then Jesus stops. 
That, that, is, that is the end of the parable in terms of the way that Jesus tells it. Now, the story is not over because we never hear what the older son did. But that was the point there. The point there was Jesus was telling this parable to the, to the scribes, the Pharisees, the teachers of the law who couldn't imagine that, that a true prophet would attract the attention and, and the listening ear of tax collectors and sinners. And so Jesus was challenging that. This was now their story to finish, to complete. And here's the, the point for all of us, for everybody listening. See, see, older brother or younger brother, the pivot point in both of our stories is not living the dream and it's not earning grace. The, the pivot point in all of these stories is turning from our way, turning to our Father, and offering our story, our life, to Him. To rewrite. See, see, the prodigal son and the striving son were both playing a game and trying to earn points in a game that the father was just not playing. See, see the father was about inviting his sons into the life of the family. And there's one way into that where our repentance meets His forgiveness, our story becomes His story. And we, we enter that place of joy, of celebration, and it's a place where we belong. That's the end game that God is going for. That's what His invitation to us is. That's the story that He wants to write for our lives. And that's how we get there. Let's pray. Oh, Father, thank you so much that you, you seek us, you love us, you call us, you, you redeem us, you restore us, you forgive us. Lord, no matter how deep we are in pig poop, Lord, the moment the moment that we turn to you, you reach out to us. Lord, you've, you've pursued me further than I thought. And I thought you ever would. Thank you for that. Father, thank you for your conviction. Thank you for your strength. Thank you for your mercy. Father, I pray that you would speak to hearts today. That, Lord, you would remind us of who you are and who you invite us to become as your children. Father, we worship you. You made us for yourself, Lord, and I thank you for that. Lord, we turn to you now. Restore to us, Lord. Restore your joy. In your presence, Father, we thank you in Jesus' name.